weakly man defeats us with wisdom from above Breaking down the mystery into lessons of love all right, praise the name of the Lord, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We are Lane and Nita. We'll be ready for Pure Smarts Ministries. All right. Uh, we're going to be doing another episode of Weekly Man. All right. So please pull up to the table, get your Bibles, and let us try to study the Word of God together. All right. We're going to start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this awesome opportunity. This is another day that you've made, and we choose to rejoice, and we are glad exceedingly in it. We come in your presence right now, asking you to teach us your ways, just like Moses prayed. That, Lord, teach me your ways. We pray right now, Father, please teach us your ways. Open our eyes to see. Open our ears to hear properly. Make our hearts to understand, and give us the spiritual energy to be doers of what we are going to be hearing today, to the praise of your glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Hallelujah, glory to God. So what are we going to be talking about today? Yes, yeah, so today we are talking about garments of righteousness. We're excited to be in a brand new series. If you haven't already, please go back and listen to the first four, or the, the four-part series we've completed on Faith of a Priest. It's really, really good. Dynamite, I believe it will bless you. We moved into garments of righteousness, and there are actually seven components of the garments that uh, Pastor Leonard will be discussing. And um, my first question to you, Pastor Lane, is this is a completely different series. It's, um, it's exciting because there's a lot to learn. But my question is, could you give us a full, kind of like an overview of what we can expect going into this new series? And also, how does it tie back into the Tabernacle of Moses? Absolutely. Praise God. All right. So we just completed the Faith of a Priest series and where we were talking about the Tabernacle of Moses. And if you have your study notes in your hands, you're going to remember that the tabernacle of Moses looks pretty much like this, right? So page number 99, okay? So 99 of your study notes, you can see the tabernacle of Moses is going to look pretty much like this. Right. So you're going to see the courtyard over here. And then you are going to see that the courtyard surrounds the tabernacle itself. The tabernacle is going to be a tent, and it is colored blue. Okay, and then it's separated into two rooms. You're going to see over there. The first room over here is called the Holy Place. And the second room over here is called the Holy of Holies or the Most Holy Place. And in the courtyard or the outer court, there are two articles over there. There's the brazen altar and then there's the brazen laver. That's right. And then in the Holy Place, there are three major articles. There is the lampstand, there is the table of his presence, table of the shoe bread, and then there is the altar of incense. And in the Holy of Holies, there is just one major article, but actually two parts. Because there is an atonement cover, which is uh, connected together with the Ark of the Covenant. And of course, most importantly, in the Holy Place, there is going to be the glory of God right over here in between the cherubim which sits under the cloud, which is the GPS navigator. Now, if you see the tabernacle like this, just out of curiosity, what does it look like? <laughs> the scratching your head. Well, doesn't it look like somebody who's dressed with a tour band? <laughs> now, we have this little art that God blessed us with this ministry. It's kind of tiny, but Maybe you're going to see it if I just bring it a little closer. Now, I'm going to pull this art together with this tabernacle over here. You're going to see the cloud and the glory. Looks like the head of Hera, it's like the tall man of his head. Yeah. Can you see that if I bring it a little bit closer? I'm, I'm, I'm hoping the camera can make you see it over there. And you're going to see that the Ark of the Covenant is going to look like the breast piece, which is mounted to his chest, to his chest, right? And then you are going to see that the altar of incense over here is going to be like that belt, that belt around his waistband, right? right? And then you are going to see that the tabernacle itself is going to be like a blue garment, even though the art is not colored blue, but you can appreciate it better when you look at another picture of the, uh, the garments over here. You can see that blue garment over there. It looks like the tabernacle itself which is colored blue and the Ark of the Covenant is colored gold. You're going to see over there. 
And then you are gonna see that over here is gonna look like the undergarment, even though the undergarment is not shown over here. Uh, the expectation is that the priests of the Old Testament will come from their undies before they come to serve the living God. Now, what's this letting us know? Well, this is letting us know that God expects Aaron and his sons to be mobile tabernacles for him. So God told them, before you guys come to stop offering sacrifice and offering up incense before me, make sure you put these garments on yourself. Make sure you put these garments on yourself. Now, what are these garments? Well, these garments are going to be seven, just from what I talked about. They are going to be undergarments, tunic, robe, ephod, breastpiece, the sash, and then the torban. Now, which scripture talks about that? That's going to be Exodus chapter 28. Now, let's read Exodus 28. And I believe from verse 1 to 5. Have Aaron, your brother, brought to you from among the Israelites, along with his sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, so they may serve me as priests, mm -hmm. make sacred garments for your brother Aaron to give him dignity and honor. Tell all the skilled men to whom I have given wisdom in such matters that they are to make garments for Aaron mm -hmm. for his consecration, so he may serve me as priests. Right. These are the garments they are to make. There you go. A breast piece. Mm -hmm. An ephod, two. a robe, a woven tunic, four, a turban, five, and a sash, and a sash, six garments. Okay. They are to make these sacred garments for your brother Aaron and his sons, so they may serve me as priests. Have them use gold and blue, purple and scarlet yarn, and fine linen. That's right. So there's six garments over there from Exodus chapter 28 from verse 1 to 5. Oh, but I thought you said seven garments. Where's the seventh garment? Well, you go to verse 42 and then verse 43. It's going to talk about the seventh garment. Okay. <laughs> Make linen undergarments as a covering for the body, mm -hmm. reaching from the waist to the thigh. Aaron and his sons must wear them whenever they enter the tent of meeting or even approach the altar to minister in the holy place so that they will not incur guilt and die. This is to be a lasting ordinance for Aaron and his descendants. <laughs> so the honor garments are going to be the seventh God we talked about over there. Now, why didn't God just put it together with Exodus chapter 20 from verse 1 to 5? Well, the expectation is, come on guys, I mean, you got to put, your, put on your undies. I mean, I'm not to tell you that. But then the father, remember, I've got some boys from Egypt over here. They don't think so. <laughs> don't forget to put your undies on. So he's over there. Yeah. So with a combination of verses 1 to 5 and verses 42 to 43, we can see that there are seven major garments of the Old Testament priests. Oh, are we going to be dressing like this over there in the New Testament? How come you're not dressing like that? Where's your tall band, brother man? Come on, where's your robe? Not, not necessarily. We're not talking about physical garments right now. We want to understand first what the physical garments are, and then secondly, understand the spiritual implications of those physical garments. If you've been studying along with us for a number of weeks right now, you're going to see that's the approach, you know. Right. So we're going to take a look at the physical ceremony of the tabernacle of Moses and understand the spiritual significance of those ceremonies. So who lets us know that the garments of the Old Testament priests are still spiritually significant. Well, guess who? The one you call Jesus. Michael Yahushua lets us know that the garments of the Old Testament priests are still going to be significant. Oh, where did Jesus talk about that? Now, we're going to turn to the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 3, Yahushua was talking to the church in Laodicea. We're going to start with that one. So we're going to be starting with undergarment right now. And in talking to that church, yeah, we're going to read from that, the very start of it. Okay. Laodicea, the church in Laodicea, Revelation chapter 3. Verse 14 reads, To the angel of the church in Laodicea writes, These are the words of the Amen, hmm. the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds. There you go. That you are neither cold nor hot. Mm -hmm. I wish you were either one or the other. 
So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, mm. pitiful, Dude. poor, blind, and naked. Oh. I counsel you to buy mm-hmm. from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich mm. and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. Ho, ho. So Jesus is talking to this pastor here in Laodicea. This is the pastor because I know what you're doing. You're a bad boy. You, you say you're rich, you don't have it. No, right, right. you're not rich at all. You're poor, you're blind, you're wretched, you're pitiful, and you're naked. Just because they're not doing something right? So lack of doing something right, just lack of obedience is going to be equivalent ultimately to spiritual nakedness. So it seems like, well, Jesus is trying to send us back into the Old Testament to appreciate what spiritual nakedness is. And then when you go over there, just like we read Exodus chapter 28, in verse 42, it lets us know that there's got to be a garment that's going to cover the uncommon parts of the body, right from the waist down to the thigh. So that's Jesus telling us to go back into the book of Exodus to go study the garments of the Old Testament priesthood. Amen. Oh, but Jesus talked about uh, undergarment. Well, he didn't talk about the rest of it. Okay, I'm going to show you. Okay. All right. We're going to read now the church. Still with the Revelation, Revelation chapter 3. Talking to another church right now, the church in Sardis. Okay. The pastor of that church, look at how Jesus is going to reference another garment of the Old Testament verse. Sardis. To the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Mm-hmm. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their clothes. Ah, yeah, go keep your right. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. Praise God. So there are some people in this church, they got white clothes. They haven't sold their clothes. Yes. For this particular pastor over there, because his deeds were not complete in the sight of, sight of Yahushua. The Lord says, your white clothes have been sold. Oh, wow. Oh, white garment is being sold. Well, which garment over there is going to be white? Well, when you do the study of Exodus chapter 28, that's going to be your tunic. The tunic is white, the robe is blue, the ephod is gold, and the rest of it. But the tunic is white. Right. So when Yahushua says over there that this pastor's garment is soiled because of their incomplete works, not doing something completely. Mm-hmm. So that refers back to the garments of righteousness. And I'm going to go on and on and on. You can do the study yourself. There's going to be another church, the church Ephesus, which was uh, putting on works of service. So they were putting on what we can call robe and ephod, but their undergarment were not in place. So numerous times we can see Jesus right now trying to refer us back to go back to Old Testament and understand what these garments are. Mm-hmm. Understand the spiritual implications of his garments and take deep lessons from that. So if you're going to be a studious somebody, a studious person of the Word of God, you're not just going to read those instructions from the book of Revelation and just toss those instructions away. No, you are going to want to find out, you know, why did the Lord say this particular person mm-hmm. was naked? Mm-hmm. Why did the Lord say this particular person's garments or white garment? was sword. And that's what we did in this ministry by the grace of God. So we went back to the Old Testament and we are going to be studying the spiritual implications of these garments and bring the lessons over to the New Testament by the grace of God. So that's an overview. Seven garments of righteousness. We're going to have a lot of fun. Praise God. Yeah, so I hope you all got on that. It's really good. So Pastor Lynn just talked about where 
uh, to kind of overview form the seven garments of righteousness. We'll be going through them one by one over the next seven weeks, beginning with this week. This week we are studying specifically the undergarment. And speaking of undergarment, and you've already given us, uh, referring back to Revelation 3, the church of Laodicea. That's correct. You're saying that, and this, and Jesus said that, they were naked. Mm. And by saying naked, we're talking about they don't have their breeches. That's, that's correct. correct. That's correct. In fact, if you read King James, Mount King James, <laughs> the next time we're going to bring up King James Version of the Bible. The King James Version of the Bible <laughs> says, put on your breeches. <laughs> put on your breeches. <laughs> Which you're going to call on decent this generation. Exodus chapter 28 and verse 42 to verse 43. Go read the King James. The King James Version of the Bible that says, put on your breeches so that you can cover your shameful nakedness. So the NIV and some recent translations of the Bible, they try to polish things a little bit. But the King James is just going to let you know, man, it's your undies I'm talking about. Yeah. Praise God. So it is the underwear or the breeches or the undies if you watch my That's children. That's correct, yes. Praise God. So, Pastor Lynn, uh, that just leads me to want to just delve into this. So, yeah. what um, could you talk to us more about the spiritual complications of being without our undergarment? That is correct. That's a, that's a very great question, really excellent question. So, we want to ask ourselves, what's going to make somebody naked and think of the Spirit? Well, God doesn't leave us in doubt. We go back to the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 3. After Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. okay. from verse 8 to verse 11. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 reads, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord come, the Lord God, as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, uh -huh. so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Uh -huh. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Let's go ahead and read that again. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? So a violation of commandments, mm. God's commands, was the reason they became naked. Let's go ahead. That's right. All right. So that's becoming a little bit clearer right now. So nakedness is going to be as a consequence of violating God's commands. Wow. And that's what we call this ministry, treason. So any action of treason, which is going to be God says, sit down, you want to get up. God says, get up, you sit down. God says, do this, you say, do it. Any explicit instruction of the Father to you or to me, if those instructions are violated, is going to result in the loss of your purchase. Hmm. Undergarments will be jerked away from you because of that. And it's been like that since the Garden of Eden. It's like that right now in the New Testament. So the body of Christ needs to hear this kind of things because, you know, the Luke gospel has either to water down the importance of obedience to instructions. And what God is talking about over here is, you know, fundamentally, you know, do not violate my instructions, right? Now, this is what we call treason here. This is the kind of sin that's going to lead to dead works. Uh, this is the kind of sin that's going to get somebody naked and things of the spirit. And we talked extensively about that in the middle section of the word, uh, specifically the message called Repentance from yeah. Dead Works. That's right. So if you remember, you're following with us, you're welcome to go back to that message or go to your study notes, going to be there for you. It's Repentance from Dead Works. Now there's, there's another category of sin which doesn't lead to death or nakedness in this, in this regard. Well, that's going to be sin of omission which is going to be a violation of the Father's suggestions, mm -hmm. okay? So there, there are times that God's not going to say something categorically to you, and there are times that God's going to say something categorically to you. How do we know that? Well, in the case of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, God gave them an implicit instruction, not categorically, but an implicit instruction to be eating from the tree of life. That's good. God pointed their attention to two trees in the middle of the garden, and the father told them that you may eat from all the trees in the garden, but about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, make sure you don't eat from that. Well, 
all the trees in the garden is going to be inclusive of the tree of life. That's right. And the Father said, I place two trees in the middle of the garden. The tree of life, the tree of another good and evil. Go ahead and eat from everything, but don't eat from this one. Mm. So that's a suggestion to them. The tree of life, you've got to be eating from it. That's good. Eating from it. Because why did the Father have to point it out? I mean, there are other trees in the garden. They may not be in the tree of, you know, bouncy bouncy. <laughs> the tree of big size, yeah, yeah. tree of whatever. But he says there's a particular tree over there called the tree of life. But it is an implicit instruction. It's not a categorical instruction. Why? Because the Father knows <laughs> this book is, if they, they may be playing golf all day long, they're not going to eat it. And if they disobey that instruction, come on, I mean, yeah. that's treated over there. So I'm going to give them the leeway. You know, you can be happy camper, swimming in the pond over there, do whatever you want to do. But this one over here is an express instruction. This tree over here, do not touch it. That's zero tolerance. Um, and in driving around your community, if you live in a civilized society, you are going to see those kind of things as well. You're going to see over to your street corner over there, do not drive your car on the shoulders. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an explicit instruction over there. Do not. See, do not drive your car along the shoulders. Well, they're not going to be suggesting to you that, well, uh, maybe just make sure you don't uh, make sure you stay no because it, it has great consequences people are going to be walking there don't pull your car over there and go knock somebody down well that's the reason the father is going to give you explicit instructions okay. hallelujah okay. now to keep your spiritual garment on your undergarment on those explicit instructions from the father what you need to say what I need to say by the grace of God is yes Lord from the bottom of my heart to the depth of my soul, I say yes, Lord, completely yes, my soul says yes. So you know how to keep your bridges on right now and say yes to explicit instructions. Uh, hallelujah, say yes. Yeah, what a wonderful throwback song. Uh, so whenever we're saying yes to the Lord, I just want to ask this question. When we're saying yes to the Lord, he says, um, you know, do this, don't do this. <laughs> we are showing him that we love him. That's so correct. you call that, I think you coined it in the message, uh, maintaining your first love. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Um, so that's, and that's also, is that also the reason that's the very first garment that has to go on? That's correct. I know you won't go into a lot of this as we progress. Mm -hmm. You'll get into it further and further. But yeah, so it's the very first layer because the commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, my soul, spirit, and then love others as yourself. So as we work through these next seven weeks and uh, build these messages, definitely build up on each other. You'll find that the first layer is love toward God, and then it'll just kind of progress until you are walking to incomplete obedience. And it's really exciting. That's correct. Hallelujah. Praise God. That's correct. Yeah, so my next question is, how do we maintain our first love toward God in a depraved generation? Well, <laughs> that's a fast forward into next week's message because to sustain the status of perfect obedience um, is going to take your tunic. Mm -hmm. So the tunic is going to protect your undergarment for you. Right. And when we start getting into the tunic studies, we're going to be talking about the wisdom of the wise virgins. Okay. So uh, that's going to be, we're going to talk about that in detail, but uh, Yahushua calls certain tactics called the wisdom of the wise virgins, and the wise virgins are not going to be uh, falling into treason because they have additional wisdom strategies that's keeping their lamps burning in the season of darkness. Now, but going back to the undergarment studies, if you were to find yourself violating instructions, I mean, this... We talked about, you know, how to rectify the milk section of the word. There are three stages to rectifying it. The God's first move, God's first move, humanity's move, or man's move, and then God's final move. Because what's going to happen is when you violate an instruction, just like Adam and Eve started feeling fear in the Garden of Eden, you can't help it. You're going to feel that same fear. It's called the loss of the joy of your salvation. It's going to be quiet because you blocked your right standard relationship 
with God as a consequence of that. You're going to feel that guilt, you're going to feel that fear, uh, but the good news is that guilt is actually your friend. It's trying to tell you something is wrong over there with your spiritual leaders, go ahead and do something about it. Now when you go to 1 John 1, 9, and Hebrews 9, 13 to 14, which says, if the blood of bulls and goats could purge the flesh of those who offered it, how much more shall the blood of Christ purge our conscience from dead works so that we can serve the living God? You plead the blood over it. You say, I acknowledge that this is a sin. Father, I confess it. If we say we have no sins, 1 John 1, 9, we deceive ourselves. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9, Hebrews 9, 13 to 14. When God convicts your heart and you feel that fear in there, you feel that guilt in there because your valid instruction, do not cover it up. Okay. Don't say, well, thank God the guilt is gone right now. Thank you, Lord, the guilt has disappeared. No, no, no. it's not going to go. And if you were to die in that mood, you're going to go to hell. Right? Okay. Because God's eyes are too cold to behold iniquity. In less than 30 seconds, get rid of it. Oh, praise God. Yes. You know, Luke and Gospel wants us to believe that, well, so long as the sin is a little bit, it's not big size sin, you know, the Father is okay with it. No. You know, what started us in a string of chaos is we read Genesis chapter 3, just don't touch a tree, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be something egregiously, you know, egregious. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to be murder or something really, really seriously, outlandishly egregious right now, you know, before God can cut you up. No. Without a of instruction, the, fa the Father has zero tolerance for those kind of things. You know, I'm going to try to break it down, make it as practical as possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this generation needs to understand that. God's eyes are too holy to behold treason. That's a no-no. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason if you come around, come around us in this ministry, for the most part, you're going to see us talking about the status of zero treason. You know, maintain the status of perfect obedience. That's what we call perfect obedience in this ministry, sustaining that status. It's not necessarily that you you don't have the ability to make mistakes, you know, because that potential for making mistakes is still there, but with the grace and the mercy of God, even though with the potential being there, you can still sustain the status of zero treason. So that definition of perfection, people need to understand it to start with. We're not talking about um, not being able to make mistakes, yeah. but we're talking about with the grace of God, you were able to sustain the status of your sir to the Lord forever. And by the time we start talking about next week, and we start to explain to you the certain principles that the Lord has shown us in this ministry, how to stay in positive four and positive three and positive two, you're going to realize it is actually doable. Yeah. Yeah. It is doable to st sustain the status of zero treason, never violating God's instruction to you for the next 20, 25 years and 30, 35 years and 40 years. You know, you can stay like that. So, but if you were to fall into treason, that's not the end of the road. First John 1 9, Hebrews 9 13 to 14. Praise God. Call a spade a spade. Father, I'm sorry. This is a saying right now. I'm not going to cover it up. I validated your instructions to me. Please forgive me, Father, in the name of Jesus. And I receive my forgiveness by faith because your word says, First John 1 9, the word says, Hebrews 9 13 to 14. Those two scriptures, please and please memorize them, put them to heart. Because right. faith's going to come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Now, when you exercise yourself in those two scriptures in faith, to your amazement, yes. Yes. guilt is going to disappear from your heart just like that. It looks like magic. And all of a sudden, you're not going to feel bad anymore. Yeah. Because the blood of Jesus is able to do that. If the blood of bulls and goats could purge the flesh of those who offered it, how much more shall the blood of Christ? Purge your conscience, my conscience, from dead work. Glory to God. And what's that dead work? From treason. Yeah. From actions of disobedience. Why? So we can carry on to serve the living God. Hallelujah. So if you fall into treason, that's how to get rid of it. Less than 30 seconds. Please and please. And you are going to see that step by step documented for us here on page number 98 of your study notes. Um, again, this is like. Uh, reprisal, if I can use that word, of the milk section of the word. It's just another replay of repentance from dead works and 
uh, parts one and part two of it. So if you've forgotten something over there, please and please, you want to go back to the milk section of the word. You are going to see those instructions highlighted over there. So we want to make sure we touch on the undergarments and this meat section of the word firstly, because every other thing is going to be on. It. And without your undergarment, every other action of obedience to our God, your tunic, your robe is going to be like a filthy rag in God's presence. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason we are right now going to be talking about additional equations. <sighs> Okay, <laughs> so from last week we talked about how PI will be equivalent to how many people can remember? Yeah, can you remember? I believe you can. Effectuality quotient multiplied by fervency quotient multiplied by righteousness quotient. All right. Now we talked about this righteousness quotient being the most uh, important at least to this generation. Maybe to other generations, it may not be just as important, but there's a lot of confusion about righteousness over here. Now, righteousness, let's call this equation, it's just getting bigger, equation six. <laughs> okay, so righteousness is going to have two parts to it. It's going to have something called right standing. That's right. Okay. Right standing or justification. Okay. Ah, uh, it's getting bigger right now. And then it's going to have something called right doing. Right doing. Okay. So, a combination of this is what we call righteousness, quotient, this ministry. Now, where the body of Christ is missed it is they treat these two concepts as if they are mutually exclusive. But that's not the case. Your right doing. Is going to give you right standing before God. How do we know that? Why? Because our Q is going to be a combination of Yahushua's ER multiplied by your personal righteousness. Mm -hmm. And this is the New Testament, New Testament righteousness question right now. How do we know that? If you go back to the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, our cube is equivalent to what we call the annual cyclical righteousness or national cyclical righteousness multiplied by personal righteousness. We talked about that last week. Right. That every year during the Day of Atonement, the High Priest is going to establish an annual cyclical righteousness for the nation. And it's a national cyclical righteousness because if he doesn't do it, then God's going to be ticked off with, with the whole nation. Right. And then when God's ticked off the whole nation, Subsequent actions of individual righteousness will look the feeling rags before God right now. Right, right. So they better not miss it. So every year they're going to have this something called NCR. But what Jesus came to do for us 2,000 years ago was to replace NCR with ER. Mm -hmm. How do we know that? Daniel chapter 9, and verse 24 it says that there are going to be 77s. And everlasting righteousness is going to be ratified. That's right. And the right of the book of Hebrews confirms that to talk about how right. Jesus didn't have to offer his body repeatedly since the beginning of the world, but he offered it once and for all, and he placed his blood on the mercy seat. Talking about what happens in the book of Leviticus. When the high priest goes over there and he places the blood of bulls and goats on the mercy seat on the day of atonement. Well, so MCR has been replaced right now by ER in the New Testament. That's good. But there's still something called PR, which is personal righteousness. How do we know that? Because in the Old Testament, even though the high priest established what they call national cyclical righteousness, if you still went ahead and then you cheat on your neighbor, yeah. <laughs> you went over and you, you burned down his property because he had uh, a bountiful harvest and you didn't have a bountiful harvest or something like that. Well, you're going to have to go to the priest you know, offer bulls for your sacrifices, depending on how big you sacrifice for your sins, depending on how big it is, their um, blood of bulls and goats, and they still offer that. And if you say, well, I'm not going to do it, well, the, they're not going to see God's favor in their circumstances as an individual, even though, as a nation, there is God's favor over there. So personal righteousness is going to be required, was required in the Old Testament, and is still required in the New Testament. Okay. Now, this because this ER New Testament is constant. I mean, Yahushua's done his part. 
what affects our righteousness quotient in the New Testament for the most part is going to be this PR. And that's what we're trying to delve deeper into with this covenant of righteousness because actions of obedience will affect this PR. So my PR in the New Testament is going to be affected by my undergarment right now. Okay. Let me it, move it up. Multiply by the rest of it. Tunic. Robe. Ephod. Breast piece. Okay. Sash. And then turban. Alright. Here you go. Oh, why? Why are we putting the multiplier here? Well, the reason we put the multiplier here is because if I didn't have undergarment and then I have the rest of this, turban, robe, ephod, and all of that, my righteousness before God's going to be completely right before God. Wow. Even in the New Testament. How do we know that? The pastor in Ephesus. Mm -hmm. The Ephesian pastor in the book of Revelation, Revelation 2, yeah. we need to have that for the sake of time. You're welcome to go read it later. This pastor was doing a lot of work. Doing a lot of work. He was persevering. He was saying no to the deeds of the Nicolaitans, and he was doing a lot of works. And then Yahushua says, "Well, your first love, you left it, and because you left your first love, I'm not going to give you access to the tree of life." So that's how we know that first love is going to be pretty much similar to the same situation that Adam and Eve went to, mm -hmm. because when we fell in the Book of Genesis in Adam and Eve. Our access to the tree of life was withdrawn. So this pastor had a first love problem. Mm -hmm. In Ephesians chapter 1, and then in, um, in Revelation chapter 2, the pastor of Ephesus had a problem. Right. And Yahushua says, I am going to not give you access to the tree of life. So that lets us know that first love is going to be equivalent to treason. Or lack of first love is going to be equivalent to treason. So that's how we know that. Just like my wife brought out beautifully a few minutes ago. So that's your undergarment. Okay. So if I have every other action of obedience, tunic and robe and ephod and all of that, and no undergarment, my PR is zero. Yeah. So that's the reason this has to be a multiplier. So undergarment multiplied by the rest of them. Uh, and then my PR is not going to be uh, zero. Now, in the Old Testament, um, okay, so, so when my PR is greater than zero, PR is greater than zero, then my action of obedience is not a field of rack before God anymore. So lots of people get, you know, sidetracked by the scripture in the book of Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah chapter 64. I'm going to challenge you to go read a backdrop to it. Well, our righteousness is going to be like a field of right before God. So why do I bother to do things right? After all, God's not going to be impressed with it. It's going to look a field of right before God, so I don't really care. No, no, no. That doesn't make sense. No. The reason Isaiah 64 was written like that, that the righteousness of the people in the book of Isaiah was like a field of right before God, was because there was no NCR. Praise God. So they've gone through, you know, many years of forgetting about what God told them, not offering up animal sacrifices. So every other action of obedience that they were doing over there, no RQ. Why? Because there's no national sequel of righteousness. But if there's a national sequel of righteousness and then you need some PR, of course, your righteousness is not like a field of right before God. Rather, it's going to be an acceptable sacrifice right now. It's going to be pleasing to the Lord. It is going to be a worthy sacrifice. Well, the same thing is going to be true in the New Testament. Your personal righteousness is not a field of right before God if your undergarment is intact. Yeah. Because you have ER already, so that's not going to change. The only thing that can change right now is do I have undergarment or don't I have undergarment? If I've got undergarment, in other words, there's no treason in my heart. I haven't validated any instruction of the Lord to me. Well, my personal righteousness is going like a 
like a sweet smelling offering before the Lord. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason the Bible is going to say in the book of Romans, uh, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Did you see present your body as a filthy rag over there? No, no, no. Your body, when you present your body in actions of obedience to the Lord, it is going to be a worthy sacrifice mm -hmm. if your undergarment is in place. Now, when we're talking about right doing, it's going to give me right standing or justification. Lots of people think, well, that's heresy of the New Testament. Well, we're going to read that scripture. It's in the book of James, chapter 2, and verse 24. Read with us. Okay. James 2 and 24. James chapter 2, verse 24 reads, You see that a person is justified by what he does, hmm. And not by faith alone. Oh, so what I do is going to lead to my justification. Not what I do alone, mm -hmm. but because faith has helped me to do right, then my right doing will lead to right standing. So that's why all these actions of obedience over here, they're going to lead to right standing for you. They're going to lead to what we call RQ for you. Righteousness question is what we call it because of James chapter 5 and verse 16. We call it righteousness question right over here. You see how? <laughs> you see how all this is mapping out again right now? Yes, yes, praise God. You know, the complete gospel message is really, really logical. It is absolutely logical. There's no reason making too much noise about it. You know, if you know it, you know it. It's just like 1 plus 1 equals 2. One plus one will never give you three. <laughs> praise the name of Allah. So hopefully you got something from it. Yes, uh, praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, so it definitely is uh, it's technical, but it's, it's also like uh, Pastor Lance, it's also very logical. And it, and it just kind of makes intuitive sense. You know, when you think about it, like um, I, I'm reminded of the man in the book of Acts, Cornelius, mm. who was really doing some serious works for the Lord. He was like, you know, giving to the poor, offering up prayers. and just. Example. Mm -hmm. Really, just doing some really cool things, and um, he didn't have ER. He didn't have ER. <laughs> it's like the the Lord sent an angel to just stop what you're doing. Mm -hmm. It's so nice, but it's not acceptable because it's, it's filthy rags. It's in great. Sense. Yes. Precious. So that's the reason your RQ needs to be connected to ER. Wow. So in the case of Cornelius, he had PR, but he's not plugged into everlasting righteousness. Right. And without everlasting righteousness, your RQ is still zero. Oh. Well, that's not our case right now in the New Testament. Yes, if you call Jesus Lord, you got ER right now. He's making an intercession for you. So what's the problem with us then? <laughs> it's this PR. So we say, Jesus, my righteousness is Jesus' righteousness. So I don't bother to do PR anymore. Well, your your right standing relationship before God is still going to be like zero over there. And in the mode of zero RQ, when RQ is zero, that's going to be no favor. Ouch. You're not going to see favor in your circumstances. You're not going to see favor, God's favor shining on you. Because the whole idea of right standing is to have God's face mm -hmm. shining on me. Okay, favor. And the higher your RQ, the higher your favor. The lower your RQ, the lower your favor. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to play with RQ. We don't want to play with our relationship with God. And we see numerous examples. A great example is going to the church in Philadelphia. Yeah. The pastor of that church had the best favor, yeah. the best righteousness cushion out of all the pastors that Yahushua talked about in the book of Revelation. Right. And he got it because of what he was doing. <laughs> The lady seeing pastor had the lowest RQ and the lowest favor. Negative RQ. Negative RQ, if you will. And he got that because, again, of what he was doing. That's right. Actions of obedience is going to grow my RQ. Actions of disobedience will tag my RQ. Hallelujah. Did you get something from it? Say yeah, to God. Absolutely. Hallelujah. God. God is for you. That's good. Yeah, so we, we understand now what God's expectation of. Uh, of our undergarments is why do we even need undergarments? Why did Jesus call his people uh, in the book of Revelations to lay the seeds? Why did he call them naked? 
you know, so many times when we read those passages, it's like, oh man, you know, I hate to be them. We want to make sure we, we're not behaving because it is a function of actions, a function of words. I like what you said about EQ not changing. Like right. once, you know, once the blood of Jesus is on the mercy seat, on the altar, it's there forever for anyone who taps into it by faith. But what can be cyclical is our obedience to God. And so that's the, I think the, the takeaway here is making sure that we are, we have our undergarment song, which means we're consistently obedient to God. We're pleasing to God long before we start trying to do good works and put on all these great things. Um, we want to our, offer up our bodies as uh, living, holy vessels for the Lord to use mightily. Right. And we thank God for it. Pastor Lynn, this is really, really amazing. You know, I had lots of other questions, but I can tell we're, we're kind of short on time. So I'll just wrap up by asking any last thoughts concerning undergarments, maybe a big takeaway. For yeah, so undergarments, just understand. So if what we're talking about is really technical to you right now, the most important thing to understand with undergarments is do not violate explicit instructions. Okay. Yeah. And I believe someone is asking right now, so what's God's explicit instruction to me? Well, that's going to be Exodus chapter 20. Yeah. Exodus chapter 20 gives you the Ten Commandments. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And it talks about the rest of it, love your neighbor as yourself. So those two commandments are really important. Love God, love people. So there are going to be certain nuances over there, just like Jesus told the rich young man, if you love me, go ahead and sell everything you got and follow me and I'm going to give you uh, the inheritance That's of right. eternal life so there may be specific instructions in that regard to you but fundamentally the Ten Commandments that's going to be God's instructions to you and God's instructions to me do not violate those instructions love go love people you are going to have your undergarment intact we talked about all of those in detail in the milk section of the word again repentance from dead works we're going to have to stop there today. Did you get something from it? Yeah, Hallelujah. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for an awesome opportunity to, to study your word. You've taught us about undergarment, O oh Lord. Yes, Lord. How your expectation is that we do not violate God's instructions to us, and we do not want to violate your instructions to us, Father. We're asking you for grace. I'm yes. asking you for grace and mercy for all of us in this ministry and everybody who's going to become in contact with this resource, oh, Father, Father, give us the grace yes. to sustain the status of zero trees in the Lord so we'll not be found naked in the things of the mm -hmm. Spirit. Satan, I take authority over you. You foul demon spirits behind sin. You foul mm -hmm. spirit of sin and death in the atmosphere. You'll have no power mm -hmm. to steal this revelation from our hearts. We cast you out yes. in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Saints of God, be free. Be free to live in obedience. Be free to have zero treason in your circumstances, in your yes. life, to sustain the status of being pleasing to the Lord, because yours is the yes. Father's favor. In the name of Yahushua. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of our Lord. Thank you for joining us today. We are Lana Nito Lude from Hero Smarts Ministries. And until next time, remember God cares about you. So do we. Yahushua is the Lord. Stay blessed. Amen. Weekly manna feeds us with wisdom from above, breaking down the mystery into lessons of love.